All right, so my talk tonight, uh, or this afternoon, it's not nighttime yet, sun's still out, is analytic theology and the project of Christian philosophy. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'll talk a little bit about Christian philosophy, and then, uh, well, in the course of doing that, I'll raise some concerns about it, and then I'll talk about analytic theology. I'll explain what it is. Um, I'll talk about some concerns about that, um, and then I'll close by saying why analytic theology is super cool. Um, so that's it. Uh, I want to start by giving you some of my own early encounters with Christian philosophy. Um, not necessarily under that label, but it's just uh, me encountering this kind of thinking. So first is when I was about nine, maybe I was eight. Um, I was laying in bed thinking about, um, you know how Jesus says, anything you do in my name, or anything you ask in my name, I'll give to you. And I thought, what if you ask God to destroy himself? Then he'd have to, in Jesus' name, like, then he'd have to do it, right? And then, like a fool, I quickly tried it, and then uh, immediately launched into a panic attack for like, you know, 30 or 40 minutes. Like, I thought, I have, I have broken the world. Like, I've wrecked everything for everybody. Maybe I should tell my mom. Um, and then after a little while, I thought, nah, I mean, God's really smart. There's probably a way out. Like, God probably thought of some way to, you know, protect himself from eight-year-olds like me, right? But this is a, this is a style of, I, I mean, it's proto-Christian philosophy, right? Taking a Christian doctrine, drawing out its implications, noticing, may, you don't always do this, right? But in this case, I notice something totally absurd or scary, or in this case, both, um, as a consequence, realized I need to alter my interpretation of the doctrine. That's one of the things that Christian philosophers do. Um, my next encounter was in high school. Um, I was at a uh, camp off of, on, on Catalina Island uh, with my youth group. Um, I was, of course, ditching the assembly um, in the evening to hang out with friends. But for some reason, they were showing a video, and I thought, like, I don't want to see a video. Um, some guy named Josh McDowell, never heard of this character. Um, somehow, we sort of snuck in the back halfway through the video, and he was running through uh, evidence for faith, um, historical arguments for the truth of Christianity. And I was just gripped. I thought, like, I've never, I, I've never seen anything like this, where someone is just taking the Christian faith and arguing for it um, on grounds not really having to do with scripture, right? So I, I found that really exciting. I was at that point in my life already sort of enamored with arguments. I thought that's a skill that I really value, that I really like, and then seeing uh, this kind of exercise in Christian apologetics, I found that totally captivating. Um, and then started to get really sort of interested in things that I now recognize as Christian philosophy. Then the last uh, encounter that's worth mentioning is when I was in college. Um, so I was, I was studying philosophy. I was a philosophy major uh, like... Um, I think many college students, I was not super into my studies. I mean, I, like I was doing fine, you know, but I wasn't really gripped by uh, the particular classes I was taking or anything like that. A friend of mine told me about a guy that he knew who had set out to become a Christian philosopher and then lost his faith. And it turned out this guy was, um, he was in one of my classes, and he didn't know that I had, that I knew this mutual friend of ours. Uh, and I thought, that is so tragic to set out to become a Christian philosopher and then to lose your faith. What I want to do is convert him back, like meet him, become his friend, and convert him back. And to do that, I'm going to have to be like the best philosopher I can possibly be. So like I started gearing up for paying more attention to my classes. I started going, I met him. I started going to this uh, kind of weird philosophy reading group that he ran. We became friends. I talked to him about his faith. 
I did not convert him back, and I haven't been in touch with him in you know at least 20 years. Um, I mean, we did get to be pretty good friends, um, but it was I mean like this was a meaningful experience for me too, right? Philosophy is something that I can pursue with the goal of like something like evangelism or. I mean, in this case, like I was involved with the Campus Crusade for Christ. I, we did the, you know, going out and sharing the gospel thing, but for some reason I've always been drawn more to trying to draw people back into the faith, you know, or something like that. Or taking, like when I think about the kind of evangelism I do in my life, somehow that's been it. Um, that's been like the main thing that I feel like I've had a heart for. Um, and philosophy has been involved with that, too. So those are just some of my own kind of early encounters with Christian philosophy. Um, you might recognize in that kind of autobiography, you know, there's a lot that I find attractive about it. There's also a little bit that's worrisome, right? I mean, this guy did lose his faith. Um, he was very serious about being the best Christian philosopher he could be, and he lost his faith over it. And that, like that has always kind of stuck in the back of my mind as a kind of occupational hazard, right? Um, and I think, you know, to a certain extent, these attractions and concerns map onto some of the attractions and concerns that professionals of, professional academics of various sorts have seen with the project of Christian philosophy. Um, so I'm gonna give you some of the pros and then some of the cons, um, and then we'll, uh, and then I'll give you some more of the cons and then we'll go from there. Um, so this label, The Consolation of Philosophy, this is from a, sort of a reference to a book by Boethius called The Consolation of Philosophy. It's basically a book he wrote while he was in prison, kind of talking about how, well, it sort of reveals how, for him anyways, doing philosophy was a real comfort in prison. I can't totally relate to that, but it seemed a good title for the slide. Um, so one thing Christian philosophy can do for you is help you to understand your faith on a deeper level, right? Um, it's one thing to, uh, you know, just know the doctrines of your faith, right? It's another thing to have thought about them deeply enough to have, you know, drawn out some of their implications, seen the connections among the ideas and stuff like that. Philosophy can give you greater understanding. Um, it helps you bring coherence uh, to your system of beliefs. Um, it helps you to make them systematic. Um, if you're like me, seeing how ideas hang together and putting them into a kind of system, that could be just a beautiful thing, right? Uh, not everyone's attracted to stuff like that, but you know, I don't know, uh, I, I play chess, not like at the tournament level, but I play chess. That's one of the few games where I think it's almost as fun to lose as it is to win, because I just love, I love what happens in chess when you can basically force someone, you know, if they're smart and they're making the best moves they can make, you can force them by making their best moves into a situation where they lose, right? And it's, it's kind of a neat and beautiful thing when that happens. It's a neat and beautiful thing. When you can do it, it's, I think it's beautiful when it's done to me. Um, and that's, you get something like that with the, you know, the coherence and the system um, in a set of beliefs. Um, rationally compelling connections among ideas also have a kind of beauty, right? Again, the chess thing, um, but also like just, I don't know if any of you were, got excited about geometry, but I, like, I love geometry where you start with some premises and then like all of a sudden you're just forced to this conclusion and it's a kind of interesting geometrical fact, like that kind of thing is cool. Reasoning philosophically about your faith can be a way of loving God with all your mind. You know, we're commanded to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, like I sort of know what some of those things mean, uh, but I think loving God with my mind the best sense I can give to that is trying to think deeply about my faith, uh, trying to understand it as deeply as I can, trying to see what 
you know, what the various things I believe imply um, and things like that. Also, too, uh, I think it's 1 Peter 3.15 enjoins us to always be prepared with a ready defense of the hope within us, right? Philosophical reasoning about your faith can equip you with that sort of thing. Uh, it puts you in a, def a position to defend your beliefs. It puts you in a position to promote them. So these are some of the, I think, obvious pros of doing Christian philosophy. It's some of why I like it. Um, but there are also concerns. You're probably all familiar with Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Um, I mean, I, some people take that to be an indictment of the whole discipline of philosophy and the attempt to do it from even from a Christian perspective. And I think it's also sort of the biblical expression of the threat to faith aspect of Christian philosophy. Um, you might ask, you know, well, why think that there's any inherent threat to faith in Christian philosophy? I mean, all truth is God's truth, right? Um, I think, in fact, there are a variety of concerns packed into this idea. Um, that are worth exploring. One that I'll just mention is um, even though philosophy can bring understanding um, and even though it can bring coherence and systematicity to your beliefs, um, starting off with the wrong premises can lead you down a wrong path. And sometimes, I mean, you know, half of why all of us have jobs in philosophy is because it's not always easy to see what's wrong with a bad philosophical argument, right? It takes training and effort and a lot of thought. Um, I mean, I guarantee you, I could give you an argument for the conclusion that you don't exist. And you will know that the conclusion is false, but you will not be able to figure out which premise is mistaken or what's wrong with the reasoning, right? Um, and so if, you know, if that can happen with even just, just obvious claims, like I exist, um, well, so too it can happen with uh, matters of faith, right? Philosophy can lead you down a wrong path. You can, like my friend, uh, come to the conclusion that philosophy has taught you that your faith makes no sense, and if you're not careful, you might follow that argument where it leads, right? Um, and I think this, uh, this verse in Colossians is giving some expression to that worry. Some of the other worries, I think, come out best if we take a sort of case study. Um, the case study I'm going to go with is uh, the project of perfect being theology. Um, this is basically a philosophical approach, approach to figuring out what God is like. Um, so some of what God is like, we just it's just sort of obvious in Scripture, right? God's loving. Uh, you, that's all over Scripture. Um, you don't need to sit down and puzzle that out. But think about questions like this. Does God have a body? Probably most of you think no, right? But, well, then what do you do with Genesis, where God's walking in the garden, right? Um, does God have emotions? You might think, well, love's an emotion. There's wrath of God. Those are emotions. Well, set those aside. I mean, does God, like, just get sad, right? Uh, are God's emotions like, like when God is angry? Is it like when I'm angry where, you know, the, like the heartbeat gets going, my stomach tightens, I, you know, I lose focus on certain kinds of things? Or is God's anger just like something, well, something totally different, right? When God loves us, is it like sort of warm fuzzies, Max Lucado style, or is it something else? Does God have a sense of humor? Um, like, does God think things are funny? Um, I, one of the Jesus movies, I can't remember which one, um, shows Jesus, it starts off with Jesus playing something like tackle the man with the ball with the apostles, um, and Peter, like, just nails him. And Jesus goes down and fakes like he's dead, and Peter freaks out, and then Jesus kind of starts laughing, like, ha, oh, I got you, and it just, to my mind, it was just really jarring, like, I can't, it's hard to think of Jesus like that. But, you know, and what about, you know, God the Father? Sense of humor? Um, 
Does God know what you're thinking? I mean, we all assume that God knows what we're thinking. Um, and I guess Psalm 139 uh, indicates that God knows, uh, God knows our thoughts in some sense. Um, but, you know, uh, in what level of detail? Every single fleeting thought that goes through your head? Um, and probably all of you are thinking, well, that's obvious. Of course God knows that. But I guess the question is, how do you, like, do you just get that out of Psalm 139? And if not, well, then where else do you get it, right? I mean, in general, how do we answer questions like this? One way you might want to go is with what some people call purely biblical theology. Use the Bible and only the Bible to develop our idea of God. The trouble is, it's not clear that that's possible, right? You know, does God have emotions? Does God have a sense of humor? You'd be hard pressed to find anything in the Bible that speaks really clearly and unequivocally, unequivocally in favor of or against that without at least finding something else in the Bible that seems to pull in the other direction. It's also not clear that this approach is conducive to what you might call a philosophically adequate conception of God, one that sort of puts you in a position to answer hard, um, hard puzzles about the faith, right? So, you know, um, take, uh, take does God love us, right? Yes, of course God loves us. Um, but what's that love like? If you think, well, it's just like the best human love, then you sort of start to face hard questions, right? Um, so I got five kids. Um, I tell my kids I love them all the time. Um, I, I don't leave them to just infer it from the, you know, the orderly uh, arrangement of toys in the basement. Um, I don't leave them, like I talk to them face to face. I don't just write them notes. I certainly don't like write a book when they're born and leave it on the coffee table and then never go hang out with them, right? If I did the, if I told you, yeah, this is my approach to dealing with my kids. I got five kids. Of course, I never see them, but I wrote this book. I left it on the coffee table. Um, I check in every now and then to be sure it's still there, right? But that's about it. You'd think you're not much of a dad, right? And if I said I love my kids a lot, you'd think like really, but you never go see them. Well, but isn't that kind of how God is with us? So, you know, I, I mean, I certainly wouldn't stand by while one of my kids is beaten, you know, if I could step in and prevent it, but doesn't God do that with us? And probably right away you're thinking of answers. Well, no, no, you know, but I, I guess my point is you have to think of, you have to do some thinking about answers like that. They don't just count, they don't just fall out of scripture, right? Um, the answers you're probably thinking of is, well, God's, God's love isn't quite like human love because blah, blah, blah. But the blah, blah, blah doesn't just fall out of scripture. So people go in for this thing called perfect being theology. Um, perfect being theology treats the attribute of perfection as a kind of controlling attribute for discovering other attributes of God. You can deploy it in a purely philosophical mode. You can say like, okay, well, what is it to be perfect? X, Y, Z, God must be that, right? Or you can deploy it with what some people call a revelational control, right? Um, most Christian philosophers nowadays advocate something like that. You, um, uh, you wanna use the Bible to sort of check the things that you come up with philosophically. But still, perfect being theology is supposed to be a kind of freestanding method for arriving at attributes of God. It relies on what philosophers call a priori intuitions. Um, basically, these, you know, just your kind of rational insight into things, a priori intuitions about goodness and perfection. Um, so we sit down and we think, you know, uh, it would be it would be much better to know absolutely everything than to have some gaps in your knowledge. 
Therefore, God knows absolutely everything. Therefore, when Jesus says he doesn't know the day or the hour of the second coming, well, we need to find a kind of alternative interpretation, right? And so we, we reason like that, maybe. Just to put a little bit of meat on the bones, um, according to perfect being theology, God is a being with the greatest possible array of great making properties. Uh, or a great making property is any property that it's intrinsically good to have. Okay, intrinsic goodness is like something's intrinsically good if it's good for its own sake. Um, something is extrinsically good if it's good only because it's good for something, right? Um, love, you might think, is intrinsically good. You know, if you say, well, why, why would you want to be loved? Or why would you want to love somebody? Like, I don't want it for anything. Like, it's just good, right? Opposable th having opposable thumbs, that's good because it's good for various things, right? Having, a, you know, I, maybe you don't have opposable thumbs. You say, I want to get some opposable thumbs. It makes sense to say, why? Um, and the answer is, well, then I can pick things up, <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic goodness. Um, great making properties are properties, well, that make something great. So like you might think being a person is better than not being a person. Being, it's better to be a knower than to not be a knower. It's better to have some kind of power than to have no power. Non-great making properties are things that are either indifferent or bad. So being blue doesn't make something better, it just makes it blue. Um, being evil doesn't make something better, it makes it worse, right? So if a rock goes from being a rock to being a person, like you think, wow, that's been improved. If it goes from being gray to being blue, it's, well, it's just changed color. If it goes from being a rock to being evil somehow, um, that's just, that's bad, right? I mean, that's all pretty intuitive. Um, but what all this is building up to is people who employ this method of thinking, which is, um, you know, much of the Christian tradition throughout the Middle Ages and on into the modern period, right? It's, it's not like something that we just made up a few years ago. Um, people who employ this method of thinking about God have arrived, you know, by and large at um, a list of attributes that now is described as classical theism. According to classical theism, God is ase perfectly independent. God is simple, has no parts. God's immutable, unchangeable. God's impassable, free from emotion, or at least free from disturbing emotions or something like that. God's incomprehensible or beyond our concepts. God's eternal or outside of time. God's omnipotent or all-powerful. God's omniscient or all-knowing. God's omnibenevolent or perfectly good. Um, whatever church you might go to, if you go to church, uh, you know, look at the creeds or confessions that are definitive of the faith of the church, if, if your church has something like that. So Presbyterians have the Westminster Confession, uh, Anglicans have the 39 Articles, uh, my church has like the Heidelberg Catechism, and um, the Belgic Confession and the Canons of Dort. You know, other churches have other standards of faith. And what you'll find is, you know, each of the, each of these churches officially endorses something like this list. And probably a, some of what's on this list may be unfamiliar to you. A lot of it, you'll be thinking, yeah, of course I believe that. Um, not a whole lot of it just falls right out of Scripture, right? In a really straightforward way, right? You don't see. Um, like the word omnipotent doesn't show up. Scripture does say things like with God, all things are possible and stuff like that. But, you know, does that mean God can make contradictions true? A lot of people say, well, no, you know, all things. Yes. So, you know, there, we get stories, right, that arise out of our reasoning about Scripture. 
So all of this is building to, again, a list of concerns about Christian philosophy. Classical theism is one of the biggest Christian philosophical projects in history. Maybe it is the biggest, right? It's what you know, all kinds of philosopher theologians have been engaged with. Um, one worry that people have is that classical theism gives us, in the end, it gives us a god of the philosophers rather than a god of the Bible. Um, it gives us a God who is too far removed from the Bible. And in fact, not really the sort of being who inspires worship, right? The perfectly independent, impassable, unchangeable, outside of time deity of classical theism, like it's hard to see how that could be a deity who is like the father in the parable of the prodigal son, for example, right? Who runs to his wastrel boy coming home, right? Some even say it's idolatrous. And again, the worry is that philosophy has just gotten out of control, right? Philosophy has stepped into the driver's seat of the theology. People say it's sexist. Um, a lot of the classical theistic attributes um, are stereotypically associated with men rather than with women. Uh, independence, power, disembodied rationality, and so on. You might think like, wait, why is independence associated with men rather than women? There's a long history to this um, that I won't go into, but I mean, basically the worry is that the God of classical theism looks very much like the dispassionate man of reason in the sky rather than uh, anything that's stereotypically feminine. In a certain way, it's no accident. Right? The people who've been doing perfect being theology throughout the centuries have, by and large, been men. And intuitions about perfection uh, notoriously can be tainted by all kinds of bias, right? including implicit bias against women. Um, it's not an accident, I think, that a bunch of male philosophers who thought um, who were in the grip of the idea that being male is more associated with being a reasoner than with being female, or, sorry, than being female is. Um, it's no accident that they would have arrived at the conclusion that a more perfect way of being is to be reasoning and rational rather than emotional, right, or something like that. Again, I'm not endorsing those stereotypes about men and women. I'm just saying that those were the prevalent stereotypes, um, again, for reasons we could get into. Uh, and it's no accident, that I think, that the male philosophers were arriving at these you know, male-skewed conclusions about what ways of being are better. Uh, people worry that contemporary analytic philosophy manifests little interest in or awareness of the his history of theological reflection, and so it often fails to appreciate the important nuances or qualifications that theologians take for granted in thinking about Christian doctrines. There's been a common concern about Christian philosophy, right? The Christian philosophers are just sitting down with bare claims like, you know, God is three persons in one being, and they just start reasoning about it without looking deeply into the history. To, at a certain point, to some extent, that was a very fair charge. Um, and I've done a lot of work on the Trinity, and I remember when I started, um, you know, there were a couple people like Richard Swinburne who really stood out as great on this subject because they actually know some, or some theology. Right? But it wasn't like people thought we all need to know some theology and especially the history of theology. It was like that's just a sort of cool feature that Swinburne's got and maybe Peter Venewagen has and you know, that's part of what makes them great. But, um, but you know, we all can still sort of proceed without uh, knowing this history. Right? I mean, that, was, that seemed to be a common thought at the time. Lastly, people worry about intellectual honesty. Um, to the extent that Christian philosophical projects manifest apologetic aims, as they often do, they seem to depart from intellectual honesty, forsaking the pure pursuit of truth, 
in favor of rationalizing one's own favorite dogmas. Now, I don't mean to say all Christian apologetics is problematic, um, but this is a topic of growing concern in contemporary philosophy of religion. And the worry basically is that a lot of um, Christian apologetics, but also just a lot of Christian philosophy, it looks more like simply rationalizing one's favorite doctrines rather than trying to give a cold, hard, honest investigation into the truth of things. This is a tricky business. I, you know, just think in your own life about the difference between figuring out your reasons for doing something versus rationalizing your behavior or figuring out good reasons to pursue a course of action that is maybe a little bit questionable, but you want to pursue anyways, and simply rationalizing it, right? The activities look sort of the same, um, but there is a real difference, right? It's good to know your reasons. It's good to think about things, and when you want to do something that's a little bit questionable, it's good to try to figure out whether that's really an okay thing to do. It is bad simply to rationalize your behavior, right? And it's hard sometimes to discern the line between those. And that's the worry here. So there are other things you could do besides uh, what people call perfect being theology. Um, but I'm just gonna move into um, talking about analytic theology. I've given you some pros of Christian philosophy. I've given you some cons or some concerns that people have about Christian philosophy. Um, what I'm going to do now is basically talk about this other activity, analytic theology, that overlaps in lots of interesting ways with Christian philosophy, but in my opinion is not subject to the same sets of concerns, right, for reasons that I'll explain. It, people do have concerns about it, and I'll talk about a couple of those, um, but as far as I'm concerned, analytic theology is, it's a good way to approach things. Um, so analytic theology is theology done with the ambitions of an analytic philosopher in a style that conforms to the prescriptions that are distinctive of analytic philosophical discourse and in dialogue with the literature of analytic philosophy. And I'll unpack all of that in a bit. And because of its association with analytic philosophy, there's been concern among theologians that analytic theology is just going to replicate the problems of a purely philosophical approach to doctrine. But I think careful attention to what analytic theology is and what sets it apart from Christian philosophy shows that these worries are unfounded. So let me say a bit about what analytic philosophy is. Analytic philosophy is basically an approach to philosophical problems that is distinguished by a particular rhetorical style some common ambitions, and a tendency to pursue projects in dialogue with a body of literature that traces its roots back to people like G.E. Moore, Bertrand Russell, and others in the early 20th century. Um, it's not the only way of doing philosophy, like some of you may have heard of the, dis the distinction between analytic philosophy and continental philosophy, or maybe between you know, certain kinds of continental philosophy and postmodern philosophy. Um, and I, I don't think those other ways of doing philosophy are bad, um, although people in all these different camps often talk as if the projects going on in the other camps are, you know, stupid or worthless or something like that. But I don't think that. I just think they're different, they're different ways of approaching interesting questions, right? And they have different virtues and different, you know, sort of pitfalls. Um, and analytic philosophy is just one way of approaching certain kinds of questions. It prizes certain kinds of things in its theories and de-emphasizes other sorts of things. Um, so as far as the ambitions go, uh, it's hard to really capture this with a lot of precision, but you know, roughly analytic philosophers are trying to identify the scope and limits of our powers to obtain knowledge of the world and to provide such true explanatory theories as we can for non-scientific phenomena. So you see analytic philosophers trying to figure out the nature of free will, the nature of personal identity, the nature of causation, you know, and stuff like that. Um, 
you know, when they think about ethics, they're trying to figure out what the, you know, what the supreme moral principle is, you know, and trace out its consequences and uh, stuff like that. In epistemology, there's a lot of, con there's been a lot of concern about, you know, skepticism, like can we know anything, uh, things like that. Um, I mean, maybe the way to think about what I'm saying on this slide is just analytic philosophy is, has deeply theoretical aims, and it's after explanatory theories. And not every intellectual project is like that. Um, so think of a lot of the theology books that you might read. Um, some of them have deeply explanatory theoretical aims, but not nearly all of them do. Um, you know, a, a lot of popular theology doesn't. Um, you know, if you read books by like Tim Keller or, uh, you know, Tom Wright is a biblical scholar, not a theologian, but you know, read like Tim Keller, Tom Wright. If you read Max Lucado, uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, um, you know, these folks, they're doing interesting stuff. Um, it, Barbara Brown Taylor, I just read a book by her. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. It's not anything at all like what I do, right? But it's, it's just terrific stuff. She's sort of like, it's maybe bad. Her stuff reminds me of Annie Dillard, if you've heard of her. She's not, you know, she too. She's sort of a poet. She's not writing philosophy. Interesting intellectual projects, right? Um, but ph analytic philosophy is very, it's theoretical, ex explanatory. Like that's what they're sort of all about, uh, coming up with explanatory theories and arguing for them. Right? You know, analytic philosophers are really concerned with precision, clarity, logical coherence, working with well understood, well defined terms, and treating intuitions or, our, you know, conceptual analysis, right, as sources of evidence. Um, and again, it's not like other people just don't care about precision, clarity, coherence, or they're like happy with contradictions and being totally obscure. Like, that, it's not that. It's more like analytic philosophers will sacrifice certain goods to get these, whereas others will sacrifice other goods, uh, sorry, others will sacrifice these goods to get certain other goods, right? Annie Dillard is really hard to read. Um, some of what she says seems to make no sense um, if you look at it really closely. Um, but when you read the whole thing, uh, what I find is I get lots of interesting insights. Uh, she seems to have a really kind of deep and interesting view of the world. I learn a lot. Um, I, it puts my mind on tracks that I really like, you know, and, and I think she is sacrificing some of the, like some of this stuff for the sake of those goods, right? I could give you, you know, other authors doing similar stuff. Analytic theology, so I've been talking about analytic philosophy. Analytic theology is a self-consciously interdisciplinary enterprise that's most successful when the methods and tools of both analytic philosophy and contemporary theology are used together and put into dialogue with one another. So it's not, as some people think, it's not a school of thought. It makes no claim to being the best approach. Like I'm not up here to say analytic, I mean, I think it's great, but I'm not up here to say analytic theology is better than, you know, uh, pick your favorite other kind of theology. Um, it has no dogmatic commitments. Um, so it's not like analytic theology is built around some really substantive claim that yeah, if you give up that claim, you're no longer doing analytic theology. Um, and it aims to display virtues prized by both disciplines. So it aims for clarity, rigor, precision, working with well understood terms and stuff like that. But it's also going to prize, it's also going to prize the value of being historically informed, um, of contributing to wisdom and, uh, growth in one's spiritual life and things like that. So given that, I mean, given that last point there, of course it's gonna avoid producing a god of the philosophers, right? One of the, you know, one of the virtues that analytic theologians will prize, um, uh, or at any rate, I mean, you can have different kinds of analytic theology, but one of the virtues that analytic theologians working in the Christian tradition will prize is 
fidelity to scripture, um, uh, you know, historical understanding, um, and things like that. That said, though, there are other concerns. Um, so you might worry that analytic theology is still mere Christian apologetics, right? We're just, you know, take an analytic philosophy, reasoning about Christian doctrine, and now we're just doing, just doing Christian apologetics. Um, I, we could talk about this in Q&A if you want. I think that's mis a mistake. Um, I think analytic theology aims at explanation and theoretical understanding. Apologetics doesn't so much. Apologetics is aimed at, um, it is aimed more at just buttressing claims that one already accepts. Um, or maybe, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, kind of going on the attack in certain ways, pointing out whole, you know, holes in other people's views or something like that. Um, but Christian apologetics isn't typically aimed with sort of the, the big theoretical explanatory picture, right? That's not typically what they're after. They're typically more after something like defensive argumentation. I mean, these goals do overlap in significant ways, but um, I think the mere apologist is more reasonably accused of slipping into rationalization and giving up the pursuit of truth. Again, that's not to say that everyone who does apologetics is. There was a certain point where I wanted to do Christian apologetics, and I had no interest in simply rationalizing um, my faith or, you know, uh, just defending claims come what may or, you know, being impervious to evidence or anything like that. Um, and I have friends who do Christian apologetics who I think don't do that kind of thing. But it's more, that's more of an occupational hazard for the apologist, I think, than for, this, for someone who's really doing analytic theology. This objection I wanted to talk about, this shows up in the work of J.L. Schellenberg, who's, um, he's a philosopher best known for presenting an argument for divine, from divine hiddenness for the conclusion that God doesn't exist. And in the midst of some of his argumentation, he has some criticisms of theology that are going to apply to analytic theology too. Some of these criticisms were written before analytic theology was a thing. Uh, some have been written sort of specifically with analytic theology in mind. Um, so in, at one point when he's discussing theological responses to his hiddenness argument, he says, we have all of us been influenced by the many attempts of theology to make God fit the actual world. Theology starts off by accepting that God exists and so has to make God fit the world in a way that is its job. But our job as philosophers faced with the question of God's existence is to fight free from the distractions of local and historical contingency, to let the voice of authority grow dim in our ears and to think for ourselves about what a God and a God-created world would be like. Now, at first glance, that sounds like noble and cool, right? I'm gonna think for myself and not just be sort of pushed around by what other people think. Um, I'm gonna work things out on my own uh, and stuff like that. But I, th I think when you start to probe it, the advice starts to sound a little bizarre. Um, so imagine offering the following speech as advice to would-be philosophers of time, which was me in an earlier phase of my career. It's our job as philosophers to think for ourselves about what a temporal world would be like. And so when we think at the most fundamental level about the idea of time, we cannot take as our guide a picture of time fashioned by physics and empirical results over the past hundred years. Um, we need to fight free of all that. Uh, we need to, you know, think on our own, right? I mean, this, that's just absurd, right? If you offer advice like that to philosophers of time, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not that a project like that would be totally uninteresting. Um, 
you know, there, there's a lot of philosophy of time that went on before contemporary physics, and it's still of kind of historical interest. But we don't think we learn a ton about time as it's conceived of by the physicists by thinking through that stuff. And by and large, we tend to think that the physicists are the ones who really have something to tell us about the nature of time, right? I mean, they're the ones who've been working on time in the ways that we think you really need to work on it in order to understand what's going on. And good philosophy of time now is deeply informed by contemporary physics. It's, um, it's a deeply interdisciplinary enterprise. I think the same is true for theology, right? If you want to do Christian, like, it's an interesting project to sit down and do pure perfect being theology just totally in a philosophical mode. You'll come up with some interesting thoughts, but they won't necessarily be thoughts about the Christian God. They'll just be kind of your own cool thoughts and congratulations, but if you're interested in thinking about the Christian God, you need to pay attention to what's going on in scripture and what people who have had as their occupation thinking about the Christian God and thinking about scripture and reasoning about that, what they have historically had to say about it in order to be a real contributor to that conversation, right? And that's what analytic theology does. Last slide. So kind of basically summing up, um, I think Christian philosophy in its best forms aims at the development of a coherent, rigorous, and explanatorily fruitful fleshing out of Christian doctrine. Not coming up with it just out of whole cloth, but fleshing it out, um, taking cues from the Bible. It is susceptible to veering off into the realm of vain philosophy to the extent that it forsakes its biblical roots. I think attempts to derive the whole content of theology from scripture represent a sort of alternative, unacceptable extreme. So you don't wanna do purely philosophical theology, I think. You also don't wanna do something that is more like thinking you can get just everything out of scripture, because I think you can't. Analytic theology, by virtue of its interdisciplinary nature and valuing of scholarly virtues that reign in both philosophy and theology, offers the promise of a happy middle ground. Thanks. So analytic theology is aiming at um, working with the philosophers and the theologians about portraying a Christian God. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there a way that it could pursue like just God in general, not necessarily limited uh, to the value of a certain religion or doctrine, uh, or what would that say on that? Yeah, um, so I guess I think any, any place you have theology, you can have analytic theology, right? So, if there, so for example, um, I'm, there's a journal of analytic theology, and uh, I'm one of the editors for the journal. We're currently running an essay prize competition for people trying to do analytic theology with non-Christian faiths, right? So Jewish analytic theology, Muslim analytic theology, stuff like that. Um, and these things will have, they'll have a somewhat different look, obviously, from Christian analytic theology, but at a kind of structural level, it'll be the same basic enterprise. So if you're gonna do Islamic analytic theology, what you would do is put, um, put Islamic theology and its history um, and its grounding in sacred texts, right? So that's gonna include our Bible, but it's you know, most saliently gonna include the Quran. Um, you'd put that in conversation with analytic philosophy, um, especially the sort of the literature of analytic theology, sorry, analytic philosophy, but also like you know, some of the key terminology um, uh, you know, also the style and the, the sorts of theoretical ambitions, right? So I've, I've focused more on Christian analytic theology because that's what I do and also because I think that's what's relevant at a university like this, right? But, you know, you can have it with other theologies too. <laughs>
Thanks, Mike. I have a uh, sort of sociological question and a sort of methodological question. You can take either or both. So the so sociological question is, it, it seems like there's not a lot of, um, not as much interplay as you'd think between sort of people doing theology and people doing sort of analytic philosophy. So it seems like the analytic theology folks are largely philosophical. So I don't think we have any, maybe one, I thought I saw one theology faculty person here. Right? But other than that, it looks like philosophy faculty and students. So I wonder if you could sort of talk a little bit about why that is and if that's changing. That's the first part. And the second one would be, um, methodologically, this looks like, even as Christian analytic theology, it looks like um, low church Protestant Christian analytic theology because it's missing the sort of tradition part of the Wesleyan quadrilateral, right? So, so you said like you talked about sort of the, the you know, value of sort of reasoning and the value of scripture, but there's sort of at least as presented, right? And I realize it's just yeah. a, you know, introductory presentation, but well, it seems like it's missing sort of a, a it seems to me, because I'm Orthodox, I can think of someone who's Catholic or someone who's a committed Wesleyan, thinking like, where, where's the role of sort of tradition recognizing the, the Holy Spirit sort of speaking in tradition, and why isn't that sort of more prevalent in the methodology of analytic theology? Or, or is it, I guess? So those, those are the two questions. Yeah, good. So, so the first, just to be sure I'm clear, the first question is, why not more interaction between philosophy and theology, sociologically speaking? Second question is, where's tradition in this picture? Um, I'll take them in reverse order. So... Um, yeah, I, I, probably the de-emphasis on tradition uh, has to do with the fact that I'm sort of a low church Protestant. <laughs> um, but I, you know, uh, I didn't mean to de-emphasize it. Um, and, and really, I mean, a sort of deeper answer is um, I'm thinking of tradition as history, right? Um, that is a low church Protestant way of thinking about tradition. Um, I'm, uh, I, I guess I'm actually a little bit more high church than a lot of people. Like I think uh, fidelity to the ecumenical creeds is important. Um, so the ecumenical creeds are, uh, it's like the first seven or eight, something like that, creeds that were produced in Christendom. Um, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, uh, the Chalcedonian definition or creed that's typically counted in there. Um, and then there's a few others that, you know, uh, some kind of weird stuff came out of those. Um, but, um, I, like, I think fidelity to those is important. I don't think they have the status of scripture. I, and these are just my personal views. Um, I think you stopped having ecumenical creeds with, I think it's Constantinople too, whereas like the Catholic Church thinks now nah, like pretty much everything we've done up until <laughs> very lately has been ecumenical because the Catholic Church is the church. Um, so in that sense, I'm showing my Protestant roots. But so I, I mean, I, I do think fidelity to the tradition is important. Um, not every analytic theologian will. Uh, not every analytic theologian will think fidelity to scripture is uh, as important as I do or will construe it in the same way. So there's room for all kinds of differences like this. Um, but so, I got, so again, at a superficial level, the answer is, I mean, I do have tradition in mind when I'm thinking about the history and, um, and pretty much everybody has to think about the history regardless of what they think of its authoritative status, right? And pretty much everybody has to think at least a little, who's gonna do analytic theology has to think at least a little bit about scripture regardless of what they think about its authoritative status too. Um, like that's just, uh, like just like if you're doing contemporary metaphysics, you have to think about David Lewis, right? It's just, you're ignoring something important if you're not. Um, so too with scripture and tradition uh, slash history. So that. Um, on the sociology, yeah, this is interesting. And I mean, I could talk for a long time about this. Um, so I'll start off briefly. And then if it's like there's no questions, then I could just talk about that. But um, so I. I, this will be autobiographical. Like, I got into analytic theology like this. Um, in the early 2000s, I started writing on the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, 
and was getting really interested in doing just philosophy of Christian doctrine. And at a certain point, like around 2003, 2004, I started thinking, it was really sad. Like, no theologian is going to pay any attention to what I have to say on these topics. Um, and I've solved some problems that are like, it's important to solve. Like, I, you know, I kind of want to tell the theologians about it. Um, and it's also sad that like, and a little bit embarrassing that I have no clue what the theologians are saying. And that's totally okay by the standards of my discipline. Like that's weird as well. Um, and I thought, you know, it sort of looks like the problem is um, theology is dominated by kind of continental, uh, so-called continental, which is like, if you don't know what that is, it's like, um, Continental philosophers take like Kant and Heidegger and German and French philosophy more generally as their important dialogue partners, right? Um, Postmodern philosophers take like folks like Derrida and others as their, you know, important dialogue partners. Um, and my thought was, Theology is really dominated by continental and postmodern approaches. Uh, the analytic philosophers of religion are obviously analytic. It's notorious that um, analytic philosophers and continental philosophers uh, have a lot of tension with one another. Um, some of it is intellectual, like they don't understand each other. And so, you know, as uh, ego driven academics often do, they just start dismissing each other is stupid uh, because they don't understand one another. Um, but some of it was deeply personal, right? Like the, you know, this kind of dismissive attitude translates into people not getting jobs, people getting denied tenure, um, people being mistreated in department meetings, people being disenfranchised. And so that the, you actually have real animosity between people who work in so-called continental philosophy and people who work in analytic philosophy. Um, uh, theology too had been, uh, just as a discipline, had been derided by the early analytic philosophers, especially the logical positivists in like the 30s and 40s. And so like a natural opinion on the part of theologians is we don't wanna have anything to do with those folks, right? Um, and the opinion of philosophers was much the, like around 2004, I started saying, hey, you know, wouldn't it be cool to get like a bunch of theologians working on the Trinity and a bunch of philosophers together and have a conference? And some of my friends were like, that sounds like a great idea, but do we have to invite the theologians? Um, so 2005, um, Oliver, 2004, 2005, Oliver Crisp, who's a theologian, came to visit the Center for Philosophy of Religion at Notre Dame, and we started talking. He was having trouble getting a job at the time because people said he's too analytic. I thought, why is that a problem? Like, that's a great thing. <laughs> um, and we started thinking, you know, look, we ought to, I mean, there's a real divide here. We ought to get people talking about it, and we ought to start trying to bring philosophy and theology together. So we, um, we came up with this label, Analytic Theology. We edited a book where people sort of talk about the methodological divide. I started running conferences at Notre Dame, bringing philosophers and theologians together. And so now, I mean, on the sociology, at that time there was, it, there was a real divide. Now, there's a lot of interaction between philosophers and theologians um, taking place. Um, it's still not always what you'd want it to be, and there's still, you know, there is still in a lot of theology departments, including Notre Dame, um, animosity toward analytic theology. Um, but sociologically, it's changing. So, hi there. Um, I wanted to ask. How do you respond to some of the concerns that you raised? So like the one where you were giving an example, like I have, you have five kids, um, but then you say like you love them and stuff like that, but you're not really there. And then you applied it to like religion, like God. So how do you respond to someone like that? Uh, how do you respond to something like that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, So that particular problem, um, 
I wanted to say as well, like the reason why I ask is because I'm, I'm a little naive when it comes to religion. I'm like, I'm brand new to Christian faith and stuff like that. So I wanted to see from your perspective, since you're very, very knowledgeable, how you would respond to concerns and flags that get raised like that, that makes me question faith or maintain my faith. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is it's not like uh, even, you know, many, many years in the Christian faith necessarily gives you the answers to these things. Um, so that particular problem is basically the problem of God's hiddenness, right? And the way the problem is typically raised, it's like, you know, look, we're told that God loves us perfectly, but um, a perfectly loving being would, here I'm sort of following uh, this philosopher Schellenberg, right? A perfectly loving being would be always open to relationship with everybody, right? Um, and you can add to that and say, you know, a perfectly loving being would also do things like maybe express it, <laughs> you know, face to face sometimes and so on. Um, openness to relationship is, uh, you'd think like minimally, if you're open to relationship, you're going to remove whatever obstacles on your end stand in the way of relationship, right? So like if you, uh, you know, if there's some girl or guy who you're romantically interested in and they don't know that you exist, well, if you have the romantic interest, at the very least, you'll make it clear that you exist, right? Um, and if you don't do that, you're behaving not totally rationally, if you're genuinely deeply interested, right? So. So what you'd expect if there's a perfectly loving and all-powerful being in the universe is everybody is minimally gonna have enough evidence to believe that God exists, right? But some people don't. Um, if you think, well, you know, Romans 1. Um, uh, what some people point out is, look, that, I mean, there are people in history who just haven't even had the concept of God, right? If you don't have the concept of God, it looks like you can't believe in God. And so the conclusion is it looks like God doesn't exist. Um, and then, you know, people go on and develop the problem and say, you know, furthermore, there's like a whole bunch of believers who are just, and for some people, this is agonizing, right? They want experiences of God and they don't have them. Um, I got into this problem when I was in college, because uh, a friend of mine was really struggling with this. She's like, I've served God my whole life. Why can't God just once whisper, I love you, All right? So the problem. Um, I laid it out because I, I need to give you some of the premises that I want to go after, right? So one of the key premises is, um, there, I mean, the heart of the argument rests on claims about love right, the nature of love and what love requires. Um, and what I want to say is, so God's perfectly good, God's perfectly loving, but divine love looks very different from human love, and we are not in a position to make good inferences that sort of go like, you know, perfect human love would be like this, therefore divine love would be like this, right? Um, and so, yeah, um, perfect human love would do things differently from how God does them, but we're not entitled to infer from that that, well, then God doesn't love us because God's not doing those things. You might say, well, I mean, that's not very satisfying, and I agree, right? So one step is just block the inference to atheism, right? Then the next step is to just start asking like, okay, well, so what is God doing to show love to us, right? And there, there are things that one can say. Um, uh, I have a story about religious experience that there's not time to talk about in detail, but like I actually think experience of God is a lot more readily available than, uh, I mean, this is grounded in psychological research, actually. I, it's a lot more readily available than um, a lot of us think that it is, so that's interesting. Um, there, I, I, I think that it's, well, I guess maybe to cut to the chase. Um, uh, 
I think maybe the most important thing to see is that often what people, once the inference to atheism is blocked, often what's left is, well, yeah, but look, there's a lot that I want and hope for out of a divine, out of divine love that I just don't get. And here I think an analogy with human relationships is helpful, right? Um, we don't, we don't always get what we want out of human beings. Um, and what we learn is, yeah, sometimes like, people just need to be allowed to be who they are. And sometimes they're very different from us in ways that hurt a little bit until we kind of understand how they work. And once we understand how they work, then we could say, oh, well, that's just so-and-so, right? And we don't get as torqued out about it. And what I wanna, basically what I wanna suggest is we can move to a space like that with God, right? Um, God's vastly different from us. Um, of course, God, of course, divine love is going to look very different from human love. Like, you know, imagine, a, you know, a, a monkey parenting a bear cub, you know, or something like that, right? I mean, uh, or have it the other way around, a bear parenting a, you know, a little monkey. Um, the, I mean, parenthood across species looks very, very different, right? And the difference between us and God is more than a species difference. And if we can learn to realize that, look, there's, there are things that God is doing that we can all recognize count as loving. Jesus on the cross, delivering, you know, we, we have the Bible, right? Um, there's the availability of religious experience, at least if you buy the kind of story I want to tell and stuff like that. Um, there's the love that you can get just from the body of believers. Um, if that's not what you want, maybe the solution is adjust what you want, as we have to do in human relationships, right? Um, I and mean, philosophically, I don't think there's really ground to stand on to say, no, God would have to adjust in this case, because what I want trumps, right? But, but I mean, that gets into philosophical argument, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more, more about some incompatible goods. So it looks an awful lot when you talked about continental philosophy as opposed to analytic philosophy as valuing different sorts of goods. But when I see what goes on with analytic philosophy, it looks a lot like the analytic philosophy is still trumping those things. And if they're incompatible goods in that way, isn't this still going to be shutting out a good deal of contemporary theology. Um, can you say what you mean by analytic theology trumping? Well, it looks like in the practice of analytic theology, it's a whole lot more analytic than it is theology. It, I, and, and it looks like it's being driven by philosophers who are wanting to, to do something more, just do something different, not by theology that's wanting to work its way into philosophy, but more like philosophy that's wanting to embrace a little bit of theology. Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, so I guess I have two thoughts off the top of my head, and then you can tell me if you want me to dig sort of deeper into it. Um, uh, so one, uh, you sort of expressed the concern about like edging out theology or something like that. Um, like sort of the way I think of um, the academic world, I guess. Um, I, I don't really want to put it that way because it's not just academics, right? But I mean, like sort of the way I think about the, the corporate project of um, uh, trying to figure out what God is like and produce material that people can benefit from in their spiritual lives, broadly construed. Um, I just think there's a lot of different worthwhile activities that, and the people engaged in these activities sometimes can profit from working together and sometimes can't, um, but there's room for all of them, right? So, um, you know, what, like one of my colleagues is a systematic theologian who works mainly on Hegel. Um, 
I've got nothing really to say to him. <laughs> I don't know anything about Hegel, and deliberately so. Right? I've avoided reading Hegel. Um, uh, but I think what he's doing is worth doing. Um, and I think what I'm doing is worth doing. And there's, there's room in the intellectual world for all of it. And so in that sense, no edging out needs to happen, right? I mean, there's, there are questions like who gets jobs and stuff like that. But um, I don't know what to say about that. But like as far as, um, as, far as like competing for turf or territory, um, I, I don't see a worry, right? You might think this, this it, it might be that um, your two concerns really were basically just one concern, which is this one. You might think, well, but still, there's a lot of theologians or a lot of so called analytic theologians who just aren't paying much attention to theology. And so, in that sense, like in the, in the literature of analytic theology, theology is getting edged out just because people aren't taking it on board as much as they ought to. Um, and here, I guess I want to say, you know, one, there, I mean, there is room for different kinds of projects and different degrees of theological engagement. But maybe more importantly, I guess I think um, that is changing. And there's, there are more people who are doing um, analytic theology in a way that tries really hard to be um, deeply engaged with both disciplines uh, and deeply informed by both disciplines. So like, I, you know, I try to do that in my own work. I think like Eleanor Stump is a paradigm example of someone who, you know, engages theology, biblical studies, um, uh, history, contemporary analytic philosophy. Um, Richard Swinburne, you know, to some extent, has done this. Um, some of his stuff is more historically oriented than other stuff. Um, and other people, too, uh, do this kind of thing. And so I guess I want to say, like, I, in a way, I share your worry. Like, I don't, I, I think the thing that you're suggesting should be avoided should be avoided. Um, but I see more of, I see more of the good stuff happening than than maybe you're seeing or something like that. Yeah, so I was wondering uh, if you comment on um, how stark a difference you see between Christian philosophy and analytic theology and to what extent we should care, I guess. So I mean, anytime I give an argument, whenever, whatever I pack into the premises of the argument, what I include in, in my evidence is going to exclude some people who don't ac won't accept those things or aren't as sympathetic to those things and similarly for perhaps implicit constraints not explicitly stated in my premises. So I just wonder, I maybe, you know, the, to the extent that we're over on the side that we're gonna label Christian philosophy, we have more general premises, and you can get less out of them, or at least it's harder to get interesting thing, uh, faith-specific things out of them. And then we have a, a continuum where I can pack more and more specifically Christian items into my premises, and I restrict my audience more and more and more, but I can get more Christian-y things more easily uh, and perhaps with more depth and nuance there. But don't we need the whole continuum? I mean, why, why, why not think that, I, why, th why think, number one, that there's a, a strict dichotomy between two approaches rather than a continuum that fades one to the other? And then if there is a continuum, why not think we just need the whole thing? Yeah. Um, I, maybe I don't, uh, maybe you and I agree on this. Um, so I don't, um, I don't have any deep personal interest in drawing neat boundaries between disciplines. I'm a lot more interested in breaking down the boundaries and making things all blurry, right? Um, I don't, uh, I don't have any interest at all in insisting that here's this one very neatly defined activity, analytic theology, and everybody ought to be doing this. And if you step out of the bounds or whatever, well, you're then you just don't count as doing or you know or anything like that. Um, 
It's easy to get the impression that I do think that from the way I pitch these talks, but the reason is I'm basically I'm trying to sell a product <laughs> here to theologians. Um, there's this thing that uh, I've been doing and a bunch of other people have been doing, you know, since before 2009 when that analytic theology volume was published that the theologians just don't recognize as theology. And that as theology has, by and large, some vices, right, prior to people becoming more self-conscious about this, you know, like being ahistorical and stuff. And what I want to do is say, look, theologians, this stuff is theology. And even though some of our predecessors have not displayed some of the virtues that you guys look for in your theories. It's not by design, and we're actually interested in displaying more of those virtues, and we need to be in dialogue with you in order to do that. Um, and the kind of subtext that I think you can glean from what I've just said, but that I've also made explicit more in conference talks than in print is like, I'd be really happy to see the, you know, the alleged lines between the disciplines just sort of crumble and for people to think, yeah, look, there's, there's this stuff going on in philosophy departments and other stuff going on in theology departments, but it's all really, it's all really similar, at least insofar as it's theologically engaged. Um, and so I, I'm happy with the idea that there's a continuum. I'm happy with the idea that there are valuable projects at every point along the continuum. Um, and what's interesting and somewhat amusing is one critic of analytic theology, this is one of the editor, Martin Westerholm, one of the editors of the International Journal for Systematic Theology. He um, sort of goes on about how embarrassing it is for analytic theologians that they don't have a rigorous definition of their discipline. My thought there is, you know, look, I mean, y'all know exactly what analytic theology is when you're complaining about it, right? And all I'm trying to do is say that stuff you're complaining about, this is theology and it's worth doing, <laughs> right? So if you think I can't really tell the difference between analytic theology and like regular theology, great, then we can stop having a problem, right? But as long as you're thinking, there's this thing, analytic theology, that I have some criticisms of, I wanna say, well, that thing, right? Either you've got like kind of a misconception that even a rough characterization can clear up, or, you know, that thing is theology, and you know as well as I do what we're talking about, right? But so that, I mean, that's more why I've been taking a posture of like, characterizing analytic theology and then saying, like, here are its virtues, right? Because I think in a certain way, we all know uh, what's being talked about anyways, and I'm just, I'm just trying to sell the idea that this, this does have theological virtues. All right, last call. Then thank you for coming. <laughs>